I'm so glad y'all are here. I know y'all about to melt out there. Y'all just so sweet with all that rain trying to wash y'all away, but God is still moving even on a rainy Sunday. Hallelujah. My buddy Ellis is preaching at um, East Fork, right? Is that what it's called? East Fork. He's preaching revival, and he's going to be preaching revival tonight. Is it 7 o'clock tonight, Mike? He's going to be preaching over there. I'm not offended if you go to revival at East Fork tonight. Okay, I'm still going to preach, by the way, and uh, but I'm not offended if you go see my brother preach over there. We want to support him this week. He's preaching all the way through this coming uh, Wednesday night, and uh, just be praying for East Fork because they're having their services. Also in here, you're going to see our goal, all right? So we have the Annie Armstrong offering that's right here, and you'll see inside, that's that pink bulletin inside your bulletin or flyer inside your bulletin. And then we have our prayer request. I would ask that you put that on top of your refrigerator, or in your, not in your refrigerator, but how about on the door of the refrigerator? How about that? I want you to notice something on our prayer request. Look to your bottom right-hand corner of your prayer request. What does it state? Look to your left-hand side of your prayer request. Prayer requests, praise reports. Don't forget to give Miss Carolyn praise reports. It's not a bad thing. God is still moving, and people need to hear the, that encouragement. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else? So there are several committees that haven't elected a, a chairman. Uh, we need to get those chairmen in there because it's almost time to do our committees again, praise the Lord. It's almost time to get them committees going again. Hallelujah. So I know you got a lot of excitement about that. So uh, anyway, God is good. My wife has got a fever. She came in yesterday, and uh, yesterday evening she started running a fever. So keep her in your prayers, and uh, I just pray you're blessed. Who's got a praise report today? Somebody give me a praise report. Stand up, I can't hear you. Amen, hallelujah. Always remember, God's still moving. Thank you for being here. If you haven't been here before, put him one in. And, uh, and there was little pews right there. They got some visitor cards, and you're always welcome here. And hopefully it won't be raining next Sunday. You know, you'll actually see some more people up in here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Come on. I know y'all believe in the power of prayer. Yes. We had a co-worker who's done it stuff for me. Severe accident. And there's a faithful few believers. We, we join in a circle of prayer each morning praying for his healing uh, and he had a fractured skull with bleeding on the brain he had a punctured lung and a broke arm as a result of that wreck and he was in intensive care unconscious and I believe the Lord answered our prayer but he is moving into a regular room and in healing right now That's meeting on their job site praying. What would happen if the Christians did that? And then, of course, I got to see Cayman's birthday. Did you, anybody see Cayman's birthday party and everything? They greeted her, and they scared the baby. They scared the baby to death. I could hear the baby crying in the background. But how old are you now? She is a teenager. Hallelujah. 13 years old. Hallelujah. Now put a rock on her and don't let her get no further. That's it. Song says, 
service this morning when the rolls call the piano. Let's stand together as we sing this one.
great day, isn't it? Rescue the perishing, number 559. Let's stand together. This will be our offertory hymn. <coughs>
glory. Miss Ruth is going to do a special for us this morning. I know she's got a good one. <laughs> yeah, it'll work. It'll work. Yeah, I got with Sharon and we kind of picked this out, and I hope I got it right. So we're going to give it a try. There's footsteps that I hear. It's that footsteps that I hear. There is something that's gonna happen as the day is growing near. It is time to get excited. It's that footsteps that I hear. Many a saint has fought the battle, run the race, and shed the tears. Oh, it's time. Let's get excited, it's that footsteps that I hear, it's that footsteps that I hear, every portal seems so near, every light's a shining clear, it's that footsteps that I hear. trying to pull up something. We have a new addition with our Reed family. They got uh, they have a baby two days ago, hallelujah. Waylon Lucille Reed. Don't y'all like that? I love it. How much that baby weigh? Seven pounds, six pounds. How much, what's the answer? Six pounds. That's good. That's a keeper. You don't throw that one back. <laughs> How's mama? Good. Everybody's doing real good, so uh, anyway. They had the baby while I was gone, still in Missouri and stuff, but I'm so excited for them. And I love that name, Waylon Lucille. I just, I, I love that name right there. So uh, y'all keep them in your prayers as Mama continues to get better. And uh, <laughs> that baby be up here, I told him now, I told him, I said, give that baby a little time and get some of the immune systems built up and stuff like that. And, uh, but that baby will be here soon. If you'll open your Bibles to Philemon, and we're going to go to Romans, and we're going to look at... Uh, Verses 1, see, it's Philemon 1, verses 1 through 3. And we'll look at Romans chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. I want to talk to you just a moment today about something that's really concerning my heart. Because I don't know if we realize, you know, as, as I travel and do different things and even going on vacation, I, I know a few people in different states, which don't mean nothing except I preached in different states. But in that, one of the biggest problems and scariest things is you're seeing churches closing left and right. Matter of fact, you see churches even with a, with a large budget, even with paid staff, that are having troubles because of some reason. 
Now, one of the things I heard, and, and we hear it a lot, and you see it on Facebook, and, and it's right to a certain extent, is that the worst thing that ever happened in the United States is when they took prayer out of school. What if I'm going to tell you it's more to it than that? What if I'm going to tell you that I believe it's more dealing with we took the church out of the house? You see, we're not having church anymore inside our houses. Now, when I say church, a lot of you are thinking right there that I'm talking about, you know, doing a typical service like we're doing here, just doing the singing and some preaching and stuff. But there's more to the church being in your house than just that. And one of the things that we used to have in our homes was we had church services. And as I was thinking of this, and I had some people saying, what are we going to do? We have, we have this, and we have this, and we have all these multifunctioning facilities but our churches are still struggling. What's going on? I'm going to tell you what's going on is you're seeing the church die within the homes because now church has become an activity that you go there and you leave from. And it's not something that's daily in their lives. And we're not looking at ourselves as the church of the living God. We're not looking at our lives as being an example of a Christian. We wear a title but there's nothing in our homes that are a reflection of who we are. So I just want to look at that a little bit. That's all for free. That don't even count. We don't even start the clock yet, okay? That don't count. I just got a lot of preaching in me, so I got to get some of this out or I'm going to explode, okay? If you can stand with me as we read God's holy word. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And to our beloved Aphia and a Crispus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 16. Look at verse 1. We're going to read through verse 5. Romans chapter 16. We're going to read Romans chapter 16, verse 1 through verse 5. It says, I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Kesra, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a secure of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my beloved Epernus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Let's use this in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for your presence. I ask God that, Lord, you would use me just as that vessel, to preach the word, Father, in truth and in spirit. And Father, we need you. We need you in our homes. We need you in our lives and our families. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. I guess that's one of the most scary things to me is we're seeing a change in society that goes way back before the, the 2000s. It goes back before the 70s. It goes back there years and years ago because at some point there has been a breaking of truly what the church is. So here's a question as you're looking at this. Matter of fact, I don't even want to ask you to do something today. I'm going to ask you to write some of these scriptures down. And I'm going to ask you to read some of this. Because if you want to have a sermon affect your life, what you need to do is bring it more than just sitting in here. Because a lot of you, it's not your fault. When you reach that door right there, you're going to forget what I said. And it doesn't matter what I say. It's so much what the Spirit is speaking to your heart. And you need to take those scriptures and apply it. So as we're looking at this, let me ask you, so is there a church in your house? When you look around it, is that the kind of place where you want the church service to be held at? Let me ask you this even. Has the church ever met in your house? Would the church be welcome at your house? You know, when I first got here, one of the greatest things that happened in my family is Charlie and Jen had asked us to come over there and eat. It's kind of unheard of anymore. You don't, you don't see a lot of families inviting other people to come, especially preachers anymore, because they don't want the preachers to see nothing in their houses. But you know what? It matters because as you're going in that fellowship and you get to share each other's heart and you get to talk about what Christ has done. Maybe that's why I know so much about Charlie. Maybe that's why I know things about Jen. It's because they were openly talking about what God had done in their lives. 
They were openly talking about how God had blessed them. Now, I'm not just saying this just trying to swell your head or nothing like this, or Charlie or Jen. What I want y'all to understand, one of the biggest differences that happens is when people know the testimony of the born-again believer and what they, they see that needs to take place. So when I'm looking at the, the early church right here, we find something that's different than what we see in our society today. A lot of times we say in society we, we, we need to have these certain things that, you know, the music needs to be a certain way or, you know, we need to sing this style and if we sing a different style of music, it's ungodly. Or we don't use the King James, it's ungodly. Or we don't use the New American Standard, it's ungodly. And a lot of this stuff doesn't have any reflection of Scripture. A lot of it has nothing except our opinions. It doesn't make you bad. But what do you use to back up your belief? I know the most important thing to me is to study these scriptures right here and to find. And one of the things I see that makes a difference in our society is whether we're having the church within our homes anymore. So one of the things you see in the scriptures is you find Aquila and Priscilla and the church that they, that they were meeting in was in their house. And here it was, we, we see where there's this sending of the Greeks along with Paul to the church at, at Corinth. Then you look a little bit further and you see where Paul sent this letter to the church in Rome and he sent this special greeting. And that greeting was at a church that met in Aquila and Priscilla's home. So over and over you see these kind of circumstances. So when you look up the Greek word ecclesia, and it has at least three meanings when you go back into the scriptures right here. One of the things that you see is in Romans chapter 16 verse 5, and you might want to write some of this down right here. It referred to all the Christians that were in a household. And then when you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it talks about all the Christians in a city. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, it talks about all the Christians that were in the world. So it's used a, a, a lot of times mostly to refer to the local congregation of baptized believers that were meeting and, and studying that scripture. But the New Testament also records there's five different instances in which this household experienced conversions and baptisms where that whole family made decisions for Jesus Christ and they were baptized and they studied the word together. It made such a difference in their lives. It talks about in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48, it talks about the household of Cornelius making that decision for Christ. And we see in Acts chapter 16, verse 15, where we see the household of Lydia. And then Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 34, we see the entire household of the Philippian jailer. And then in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, we see the household of Crispus. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, we see the household of Stephanus. Maybe one of the most neglected things that we've done in our, in our whole world, our society, is we've neglected to bring Christ into our house and make it a church. Maybe it's one of the most neglected things that we're having today is we we're neglecting to present the gospel message to an entire household that they can see Jesus Christ. You see, until that whole household is transferred, tra transformed by the blood of Jesus, there's these problems that take place. Maybe when you're looking at your house today, maybe even as I'm speaking, you're starting to catch the picture. So where's the church? It can't be just right here in this structure. When you look at this question, a lot of times you automatically think of an address and you think, you know, Mount Pleasant, Gloucester, you know, with such and such street address. And you think that's just because where you have the Bible studies at and the worship services and that's where you sing a couple songs that you remember from days gone by. But the New Testament doesn't focus on the place, uh, but rather a people, a people who call themselves born-again believers. So if, as we secularized our, our, our world, we, we've taken and we believe everything that the, the world tells us, what we're doing is pushing the church, uh, the church outside of our homes. It's not just prayer in the schools. There's no prayer in the house. There's, there's nothing that takes place that represents or, or reflects a born-again believer. So we see right here, we, a lot of times we're, we're not visualizing our, church, our homes as being a place where we have communion with God, where we are, are, are always praying and seeking his face. Some people just see their house as a place where they go to, and, and basically they just stop and they refuel. In other words, they they're just come home and, and they just leave. 
It doesn't really matter to them. See, the house isn't what it used to be years and years ago. Some people treat their home more like a restaurant, and so they stop and, and they, they eat, and maybe they drink something, and, and they're, they're just getting, going on and carrying on their, their daily activities. What does your home look like? How does it reflect who you are as an individual? Some people picture their homes as nothing more than just a motel room. They, they go there, they sleep, they get up, and they leave because they're always running around. Some people think of their house as just a hospital where this is where you're taking care of the sick people and the people are, that are going through and suffering. And some people manage their homes more like a business because that's where they make their living at and they have a lot of different things. It's a factory where they produce and they ship out and they make kind of stuff. But have you ever stopped to think about your house as a place of worship, a house as a place where the church meets to carry out God's work, as a house where you experience the blessings of God. Maybe that's one of the most difficult things. Maybe that's one of the problems that we're having is because the homes aren't the church anymore. The home is, is just where you truly are who you are. You see, if you're the church, you're having church every day. If you're the church, then it shows up and it's not just a street address that you go to. If you're the church, then everywhere you go, the gospel message is presented. When I understand and, and I look at the scriptures here, one of the things that you see is the church is where God's people are at, right? So I was reading this story about a missionary who was going to the Indian reservations out west. And it, of course, it was long, long miles of flat road and dust. And, and as was one missionary, he pulled up. He described as he pulled up and he got out of the car, the child on the front porch jumped up and he says, he started hollering at his mama, Mama, the church is here. The church is here. See, he didn't know the missionary's name. He didn't know everything, but he knew his business was to present the message of Jesus Christ in his house. And he goes in there and he's telling his mama that the church is coming, the church is coming. Let me ask you, when somebody greets at your house, is it more like, put the beer away, the preacher's here? There's only a couple people left. You see, we don't treat our homes as a place of worship. There's too many people, there's, there, there, there's people out there and they're, they're not dwelling in a place of peace. They're not dwelling in a place of worship. They're not taking the time to understand that it's their job to lead their people to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, we know that the church is where the biblical teachings take place, and it's, it's conducted. So in the New Testament days, the church wasn't just that building where people went to to hear the sermon. It wasn't just that place where people would sit out there for a few moments and, and hear a little bit of the gospel presentation. The church was a church when the people met to study the teachings of Jesus Christ. Shouldn't that believe where our homes is at in the first place? Shouldn't that be in our lives? You know, as Brother James was saying right there, the difference it made, there's a group of believers a group of believers who not only they prayed but don't you imagine they talked about the power of God moving right there shouldn't that be common in our lives your children are not going to understand or your grandchildren are not going to understand the power of God if they don't see it in the church that's right there at your house believers in the, the, in the scriptures right here, they followed that tradition, the traditions of the spiritual forefathers and, and they took the instructions of, of the apostles and they studied the teachings of Jesus Christ and it showed up in their lives. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, did I give you that one? I may not, I did, but praise the Lord. Uh, do you got verse 6 there too? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. That's okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Oh, thank goodness. Verse 6, and then we'll read verse 7. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
So when you're looking at these scriptures right here, it's talking about teaching your children all day long about the Word of God. And you say, oh, I just don't want it to be that way. You know the reason you don't want it to be that way? It's because you're not reflecting that. It's not that you're choking them with it. It becomes a natural conversation. When you're filled with that Spirit of God, you're reflecting Christ in your conversation, what God has done and how you should. You wonder why children are disrespectful is they haven't learned what the Scripture talks about. They haven't learned what it means to be respectful. Well, all kids are that way. I, I've actually heard people say, They're j boys are going to be boys. Let me tell you something. You better start rebuking that stuff. Because here's the deal. You're either teaching them as the Holy Spirit has led you, or you're teaching them the way you think they ought to go. So the Holy Spirit is giving us the wisdom to go and teach. And it says right here, Moses is talking about to, to go and teach them all the times in their lives. Every believer, they, they need to see uh, their, his or her home as a place where the biblical truth is taught and studied and implemented. Not just talked about. It's so important for the spiritual education to be taking place in your homes. So, see, see Jessica's over there. Uh, Jessica, what's one of the hardest things about being a teacher? When you sit homework home, is there many parents helping their stu children do study? Uh, the, the different, uh, no, I, I haven't prepped this up, so I may not get the answer. <laughs> do, they, do they help their kids with their studies and everything? All the time doing their homeworks and all that? Well, not really. Every now and then they do, though, don't they? But not all of them. I, I guess it could function both ways. I've heard teachers say all the time, you know, it's so hard because we have to teach the children manners. We've got to teach children respect. We've got to ch teach children how to behave, how to sit down, and when is told to sit down. They've got to do what's called parenting. Have you ever thought about it? Well, Brother Blaine, are you crazy? You know what year this is? This is 2018. Really? You still having youngins? If you still having youngins the same way they've been having youngins for all these years, maybe you ought to still be raising your youngins. Not just sending them out there, Charlie. I'm only go, you're going to want to go talk to me today. <laughs> We need to take the time to raise them up. The biggest struggles that are in the school is they don't know how to act or behave or show respect or discipline themselves. Now, how did y'all know better than to cuss around your parents? Well, there we go. Sister's talking here. Slap your head off. Wash that mouth out. Yeah. What's the difference? There's no one to hear the children anymore. You want to see what's different in our society is the difference is the acts of how we're trying to raise our children. Oh, it's the school's fault. It's the church's fault. It's everybody's. Let me tell you something. Until we say that it all stops here. That we're, it's our responsibility. It's so important for spiritual education to take place in the homes where people know what they believe and why they believe it. You wonder why the children drift is they don't know what they believe. You see, they have to understand the scriptures. The building is dedicated to the service of, of delivering that, that special message of Jesus Christ. But your home is there all the time. All the time. The church is, is, is where Christian fellowship is, is, should be something that's enjoyed. You know, in, in the early church, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, I'm going to be throwing him around. Here it is. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And listen to this. And in breaking of the bread and in prayers. Now, this is where people usually get sour at. Because when I start talking about breaking bed, do you understand how much work that is, Brother Blaine? This is where we're at in our society. We've lost the contact of how to raise our homes anymore. So the early church would actually share the food between the, the disciples and the visits in the temples. When you look at that, so they broke bread and from house to house, right? 
So they not only shared the food right here, but they shared their, their experiences. I guess one of the things they say, the most healthy, unhealthy part of being a Southerner is we associate every activity we do with food. If we go to a movie, we eat food. If we go to somebody's house, used to when you went to a pa that's why preachers are so fat. I'm listening, I'm listening to who's laughing. I, I can identify, I've been here long enough now, I know who you are. That's my excuse. <laughs> so when you go around, you know, used to the, the tradition was you eat a piece of cake, and most of these ladies here know, you know, I'm not big on that, or, or eat a piece of pie or something like that, and you drink. But here's the thing. As you're sitting and you're, you're eating pie or drinking coffee or doing these things like this, people were inviting you to their homes. Let me ask you, when's the last time you invited somebody to your house? That's my buddy. You the man. How many have you invited to your house? Let me ask you, how many new people in this church have you invited to your house? Why? I'm just asking. I don't know them people. You reckon the apostles and all these disciples knew of these people as they were going out there and delivering us? Why? One of the things we've lost is the contact of reaching them and sharing with them over a cup of coffee and sharing with them over a, a piece of pie or just sharing with them, period, about the experiences of your life. If you're a born-again believer, you have a testimony. You have a testimony that's more than, well, I was born in such and such year, and when I was born, this happened. What did God do in your life? As a born-again believer, we all, it, you didn't have to be a crackhead. You didn't have to be alcoholic. You didn't have to be a wife beater. You didn't have to be a runaway. You didn't have to be all these things. You just had to be lost and saved by Jesus Christ. And when someone hears these testimonies, it encourages them to say, you know what? Somebody was just like me. So when you see this right here, and they start talking about, the, the insights to what God has done in their lives, and they start seeing the, seeing the purpose of God in their homes and their family. And it starts being shared, and they start having that enjoyment with the fellowship. And there, it starts coming down to this. It's more than sitting and eating a meal. It's about sharing your life experiences. You see, when people find out that we're just common people, sinners saved by grace, Changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I once was lost, but now I'm found. So people think that everybody in the church is so perfect, so perfect that they have no problems. They've never had marital problems. They've never had financial problems. They've never had problems with their children. It's a lie. Can you still hear me, Charlie? You should have said amen to that. I'm going to have to give you a prompt sign. Listen, when people start seeing that and you start finding out what God has done, I'm blessed because as a pastor, I get to hear your testimonies about your homes, your families, what God has done in your life. So many people have invited me to their homes and to share th that part of their lives. But can you imagine the difference it would make with somebody else who might feel discouraged, who might be going through some kind of difficulty, and they need to hear what someone who's indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit is experiencing in their life. As the Holy Spirit has changed, has transformed you, of all the different things, and see the momentous task that has taken place place in your home because what God's doing when you start telling others about Jesus your home becomes the church it becomes a lifeline to people that are lost and dying and when you see your children and your grandchildren you better be the church because if not who's going to help them the church is where the, it says in scriptures in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 42 right there and, and then it goes on further on in chapter 12 Verse 5, Acts chapter 12, verse 5. It says, and, and Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And then it, it says in verse 12, chapter 12, verse 12. It says, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many gathered together, listen to this, praying. Not gossiping, 
not talking about what preachers or deacons are doing or what the music is or anything else. They were praying about the power, seeking the power of God to move in their lives and in their homes and in their families and in their community. Jesus was, you know, he quoted the Old Testament saying that God's house was to be a house of prayer, right? So here's the thing. A lot of times when we say that, we say that that's, this is the church. So our brain goes over here to this particular structure. But when the church is in your home, now here's a great thing. Lots of people bring me to, I've been to their houses, and they get their little children to pray, and they get their babies to pray. And that's wonderful. But I'm going to tell you, this, this ain't going to sound good. <laughs> I'm not impressed by that. You know what impresses me? When the adults pray. I mean, you can always see the children, thank you, Jesus. They pray in power. But you know, as they get older and they start thinking, see, what they're trained to do is that that's for the babies to do. Have you ever thought about it? That's just for the little ones to do. The adults don't do that. Let me tell you something. The children should be seeing the parents praying. The children should be seeing their parents read the Bible. The ch children should be hearing about the, the parents' experiences of accepting Jesus Christ. One of the things that has happened, and, you know, and when I say this, I know first thing people's brains go to is cottage prayer meetings, where once a year, when they have that revival, and it's always in July, and, you know, and listen, every place I lived at, everybody has their, their is the south, in the south it is, they have all their prayer meetings in, in, in the revivals in July, and that's a great thing, and praise the Lord for that. When do you have another prayer meeting? You see, if you want to see the power of God, then you need to be having prayer, and you need to be having intercessory prayer. It's always good when I get to hear, like, Brother James over there, and you hear James preaching all the way across that hall over there. Brother James in there, he's preaching, 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 preaching fire and brimstone, you know, and I'm seeing smoke come out from under the door and stuff like that. But isn't it great that somebody's bold enough to have a prayer meeting? Intercessory prayer for some other individual who's in a tragic car accident and they're seeking God and they see the miracle. Do you imagine that maybe somebody on the outside would see and hear that prayer and say, My goodness, look at what God is doing. The God of all creation hears them where they're at in this old workplace and he is moving. It wasn't just in the structure of a building. It was in the power of a group of men that were meeting who believed that God is alive and well. Let me tell you something. The church is where people are also coming together and they're giving God all the praise. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I'm always amazed at how people think, Well, if you get if you get this, if you, you get this kind of building, or you do this, or you do, let me tell you something. If we were just doing that, if we were giving God all the praise and glory, because as born-again believers, you should be seeing the hand of God moving, and you should be in his favor. You see, the church is where the praise is given to God. You know, I always tell people when they're going through different things in their lives that they should encompass their house with praise music. They say they should always be having that praise and worship music that's taking place in their homes. Parents should be consistently in front of their children giving God all the praise and the glory. Look, have you been blessed? Has you, have you seen the blessings of God in your home and in your life? Do your children hear them? Do your grandchildren hear about it? Do you, when people are coming to your home and, and visitors or neighbors or loved ones, and, I, and, and listen, listen, you've got to get past this. We don't talk religion and politics, whatever. Some people just want to debate about Republican and Democrat. Let me tell you something. You need to be talking about God. The reason you're not seeing the people's lives change is because no one is seeing the power of God in the homes anymore. It's more to it than just meeting in a structure. 
Every time someone comes in our home, we need to tell them if you've had cancer, if God's healed you, if God's saved you, if God's rescued you. It's more than you just getting on the Facebook and you just put them little prayer hands up there. We're praying. Really? Really? If we come to your house and you're putting that on Facebook, would we catch you praying? Or would we catch you just pushing? Ain't that how it does? I don't know. I'm not real cool with all that. I know I look cool. I'm not cool at all. I heard that too, Charlie. You see, we got to tell the visitors, not only tell them, but show them about praying. How do you appreciate God's blessings? How do you appreciate God's blessings in your home and your life? How do you appreciate God's goodness? You say, Brother Blaine, you don't know what I've been through. Yeah, I do. Every one of us have our things that we've been through. Every one of us have hurts. Every one of us have disappointments. Every one of us have experienced failure. Every one of us have been through things, but God has gotten us through it. And if someone never hears your testimony, how will they know that they can get through it? How long has it been since you praised God in front of visitors in your home? I'm not talking about just break out a bunch of stuff and, you know, celebrate a bunch of stuff. I'm talking about Give God all the praise and glory of what he's doing in your life. Do your children know more about the other things of the world than they do about your relationship with Jesus Christ? What about your grandchildren? See, the church is one of the places, it is, it is the place where conversion should take place, and, and you should be leading your children to, to know Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, said, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily, by day by day, those who were being saved. See, you understand this? Has anyone ever been saved in your home? On your porch? Has anyone come to know Jesus Christ? But, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and, and I pray your children have come to know the Lord in your house, and that's, that's absolutely, praise the Lord, it changes their whole eternity. What about somebody else? What about their friends? Have you ever used your home to share Jesus with somebody? To share what Christ has done in your life? See, conversions are more than just preachers and, and Brother Ellis preaching revival down there, which it's more than just preaching the message. It's about the transformation of your lives by the blood of Jesus. It's more, it's more than just taking place here because we're going to have an altar call and you got music. You ain't getting saved by that music. You're not getting saved by the piano or by Brother Raymond singing. You're saved by the blood of the Lamb. And when we come down here and have an altar call song, it really, you know, it sets the mood. And, and, and I understand that. But here's the next thing. I should be able to walk down there and just say, if you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, when are you going to do it? If you leave here today and you were killed in a car accident, would you go to heaven or hell? For without Jesus, you're lost. Conversion can take place right there in your home. But here's the problem. Homes aren't being the church anymore. Homes are not being the, the place of, of biblical education. You know, it's sad. I'm going to tell you, I'm not beating up on nobody. I'm just going to tell you. So the last two Sundays, we've had 50s in the Sunday schools. Here's what you need to know. Nobody in the nursery. Nobody in the toddler's rooms. Who is that? That's the babies. But I guarantee you, when I'm dead and gone and your children are raised up and all of a sudden someone asks them if they ever went to church, they're going to say, we went to church. But you ever wonder why we don't have Sunday school teachers? Do you ever wonder why we don't have enough? It's because they have to be educated in the Word of God. Otherwise, when they get out there and, and when they go to the colleges and stuff, they're going to hear things that question them. They're going to hear things that are going to challenge their beliefs. And we only have, it, it seems like right now when we have these babies here and everything, so the baby's two days old, right? It seems like, oh my goodness, I got all these years. It's just like that. It's gone. One day, came in was just like that. I seen her picture. Just a little baby. No, not you, baby. You're, you're almost grown. I can tell. 13. She's 
She's going to graduate. What's she going to take with her? What are your children going to take with them? What are your babies going to take with them? What about your grandchildren? While you're saying, you know, I want to be a peacemaker, let me ask you something. Are they going to go to heaven? Well, they got christened, whatever. Have they ever given their hearts to Jesus? See, conversions can take place in your home, and they can take place in the church. And they just got to be that place where somebody presents the good news. Where do you live? I hope you live in the good news capital. I hope you put a sign up this week that says, this is the church. This is where the message is taught. I would hope that a revival would break loose and we would quit being, ah, this don't sound good, cowards. The only hope your family has is if you're willing to present the gospel. Everybody wants somebody who's aggressive, right? Drain the swamps. Drain the swamps. Get all them hoodlums out of Washington. What if we looked at it like this? Drain our homes. Lead them to Christ. Quit putting up with the world. Share with them Christ. Start inviting your neighbors. Start not inviting people to your house. Come over here and drink some coffee. Come over here and have a meal. Come over here. I got something good to tell you about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in my life. Wouldn't that be something? Now that's revival. Amen? If you could bow your heads for just a moment. says they're coming down we're going to be doing what's been done for 120 some years in this church we're giving an altar call and this altar call these altars are open they got pews up here you don't even have to be because I know it's not conducive to really have an altar down here we, we have a little bit small area up front so everybody says well it's crowded here's the thing plenty of rooms for knees and prayers and sitting <laughs> What have you prayed for your home? What have you prayed for your brother, your sister, your mama, your daddy? What have you prayed that God would use you? Your testimony to change your world. What if? God's still moving. He's still doing miracles. Don't give up. Brother Blaine, I have been doing this for years. I've been doing this for years. Are you going to give up? Never surrender. Never back up. Go forward. You might be the only church that some of them enter. You might be the only church that people hear about Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, let me tell you something. Today should be the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. If you need to rededicate your life to Christ, get to walking. It's time to get busy dedicating, doing what you're called to do. Don't be scared. Christ is still moving. He's still all-powerful. Won't you come this morning? Every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Trust.
Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, we can come into your church today, feel your presence, know that you love us, know, Father, that what you're doing in our lives and in our homes. I lift up every home here today. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they will be the church of the living God, that, Father, that you will protect, encourage, and strengthen. Lord, so many times people get to walk in that long path and they get weary they get worn, they get discouraged. But Father, we seek your face to be the encourager today. That Lord, the Spirit would overflow in our lives. And that as we're at the house and Lord, as we're out there, that Father, in the name of Jesus, you would give us the words to say, the testimonies to share, and that Father, it would be life-changing to our loved ones and to our friends and to our neighbors. You're the only hope and we believe it, Father. Bless these homes and these families. May they go with the peace of God. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.